Good afternoon, good morning, uh, and hopefully not good evening to too many of you. Um, welcome to our webinar, Achieving Equity by Building Community Through Tangible Strategies, Policies, and Evaluation. I'm David Chavez, Senior Fellow at Community Science. I'm joined by Kian Lee, uh, Vice President, and Marisa Salazar, uh, Associate, who will, will be joining us in this uh, at, uh, presentation on what we think is a very important title, uh, topic. Um, I also want to introduce uh, uh, Dante Cowens, who's going to be behind the scenes making, has been on behind the scenes and making all of this work. Um, Dante? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. As David said, um, I'm going to be behind the scenes. So if there's any, like, any technical things, you can just directly message me. Or if you need captions, you just look at the bottom tool bar and you'll see enable captions and then you, um, you're all set from there. Okay. I'll pass it off. Okay, great. Thank you. And you'll be able to add questions uh, that we hopefully will have time at the end to address. Um, again, um, we'll try to get through as many as we can as we go through. So I want everybody to sit back. Uh, and uh, this is going to be moving very quickly. Let's grab onto your seats because uh, we have a lot to cover today. Uh, first, I want to just introduce you not only to our team, but to our uh, not only good looking, but very, <laughs> uh, very uh, uh, experienced team uh, at Community Science, where we have been seeing ourselves a research and development organization working with foundations and nonprofits and governments to address. Uh, social problems and systems change through systems change that focus on uh, developing healthy, just, and equitable communities. Um, the key takeaways today is really going to be focusing, focusing on, on a framework for achieving equity through building community. It's not as though we're developing something new and there's all this stuff. It's really beginning to provide a framework so we can really understand the importance of community. Um, there's no panacea, there's not a panacea. We're going to be looking at research-based uh, and you know um, practices and strategies that have been shown to work across different cultures. But we're really coming up with an actionable, measurable framework to taking this work and be able to focus on the importance of strengthening communities. Um, we'll be um, uh, covering several topics um, um, today. Um, you know, and so um, around not only the key takeaways, but why, why we have to strengthen community now, uh, the, presenting the strength of community framework, uh, and then how to evaluate a strength of community uh, initiatives, uh, as well as talking about what will be coming next. This is a very important subject right now. There's probably no more important subject right now that we're dealing with in our country or even globally than our relationship with each other. When we look at everything from global uh, warming and global, global uh, changes, climate changes, to our economic systems, our political systems, the threat to democracy, it all boils down to how we relate to each other and those relationships. And that's one of the reasons that we'll talk about today, the importance of beginning to frame our work. Um, around the strengthening, developing of a community, as community is a framing for our social policy and our strategies. Evolutionary biologists, theory, leading evolutionary biology theories, as well as all the research from 150 years of medical and social sciences, um, all point to the importance of community for our well-being. That's our about our our environment, our ecology is not just the air we breathe, but the red social relationships and our relationships with institutions. And therefore a framework that really looks at strengthening community is really critical for our well-being. Um, late psychologist Paul Dokeke talked that all policies and all actions should go through a human and community development impact statement, just like we do environmental impact statements. And we hope in today's presentation, we'll be starting that discussion among us as we begin to how to frame our work and to really concentrate on fostering community because it is so essential, the most essential thing for our collective well-being, um, not only politically, socially, but medically and psychologically. So with that, 
Um, I like to start these presentations, if you've been through the second part of the series, with this important vision that Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King had, which is our goal is to create a beloved community. And this will require a qualitative change in our soul, as well as a quantitative change in our lives. I think it's really created a path to change we begin to look at focusing on that. That, you know, we've heard about red and blue in these different communities. How do we find that core commonality um, that begin to work on dealing with some of our issues. And that's where we're going to be framing it today and starting with uh, our look at theory around, around that. So, Ken. Thank you, David. Um, so why, you know, as David mentioned, this is, this is important. It's always been important, but it seems like it's more important than ever now. And why is that? Um, you know, there are so many reasons for this. And one is that racism and other forms of discrimination continue to persist. Threats like climate change and pollution affect certain populations' health more than others, as well as our planet's well-being. Some communities are still struggling to recover from the aftermath of COVID-19. Work practices have changed. People are afraid to go to crowded places. Some prefer to stay home to work. And as a result, we're facing an epidemic of loneliness and isolation, as our Surgeon General has declared. We have more clashes about our political differences, our cultural differences, our age differences, and more, right? We seem to become increasingly divided and polarized and not less divided and polarized. Um, diversity, equity, inclusion strategies and concepts are all under attack. Certain books are being removed from our students' li reading lists because they refer to the critical race theory. Um, or suggest that some populations continue to dis to experience discrimination because of policies um, that seek to maintain status quo. And for all of these reasons, we need to strengthen our community and start to break down what we see are those differences um, among us and really focus on what we have in common. That doesn't mean we ignore the power, we ignore what's different, but we got to focus on the similarities and the commonalities as much as we understand our different cultures, our different traditions, and what we each bring to the table. And basically, we need to strengthen community now because how we treat who is and isn't part of our community is hurting all of us. Okay. Um, you know, who is and isn't part of our community is complex. You know, it's because we tend to belong to multiple communities. Um, and it's multiple communities inside of community. So much like this Russian stacking or nesting dolls, um, it's a great illustration of what we mean by how this community is nested inside communities. Yeah. Turn it over to you. Lisa. All right. Um, so back in 1986, um, David McMillan and David Chavez, who of course is here today, created the sense of community theory. And they theorized that a sense of community is comprised of four key elements. And each of these elements, you know, though unique, of course, depend on each other to comprise a sense of community. In other words, uh, you might not expect, for example, for someone to strongly feel that they're a part of a community if they have a super high sense of influence, but absolutely no emotional connection or membership, right? That sounds more like they have a lot of power, but they're not necessarily a part of a community. So what are these key elements? Um, so they include membership, fulfillment of needs with sharing of values, influence and shared emotional connection. So for membership in communities that have um, high uh, sense of membership, what we can expect is that people come together around shared values and common goals. They are clear about who is and isn't part of their community. Um, membership also provides a sense of belonging based on trust and security. Next is fulfillment of needs with sharing of values. And what this looks like is that people's common needs can be met by being together. So for example, within a town, there may be doctors, teachers, business owners who choose to be in community together and by doing so are getting their needs met or their common needs met just by being together in a community. Um, next, you have influence. So within a community that has high influence, what we could expect is that people know that their voices count. Um, there is both individual and collective efficacy that comes through being together and asserting their voice. And finally, 
we have shared emotional connection. So with shared emotional connection, this is a feeling of connection created through sharing of important experiences together or a sense of shared history. And oftentimes with communities that have this strong sense of uh, shared history, oftentimes you haven't even met other people that are in that community before, yet you feel so strongly uh, within community with that person or with those people. Um, so those are the four elements and now I'll turn it to David for the next important thank section. You. Thank you. So thank you, Marisa. And I think it's important to know that this, this research has been tested. This is, we're looking for an empirically driven approach and evidence-based approach has been working globally in studies, thousands of studies around, around the world about how fundamental is fundamental need and how critical it is for our future. So how do you start thinking about ways to increase the sense the sense of community at the core of what community is, is that feeling that I'm part of a community. And it's really based on the four questions, four questions that begin to frame uh, how you think about the strategies. Again, there are many things, there's nothing new that you do that that's gonna be offered here, but how do you put it together in a way that is, that is comprehensive and deals with all the components by asking what are the common priorities of people in your community by having that common need, communities come together around common needs and what those are really judged by their values, what they think is important. And so different communities can have different needs and over time, those needs will change. Um, how can people come together to meet those needs or make those changes, okay? Can it be through organizing and doing that work, through their leadership, organizing and doing work to change policies and practices or conditions? Is it in the workplace where they begin to have more participation and management and decision making? Um, as well as their, through their leadership, okay? How, do, how does their leadership become more responsive to the needs of members of their community communities? Um, how can you develop around membership? How can you develop a sense of membership, belonging, safety, and trust? That sense of security by knowing who's in your community and who's outside your community. An issue we're going to deal later in the webinar, but very important to have that, that sense of belonging. Are you creating that connectedness, that sense of I of, of identify with being part of this community? I'm proud of it. And finally, as, as Marisa said, what are those positive experiences that you can create and build into the common, build on common culture, history, needs, or dreams? Those common experiences that are really important to people. Creating that, it's not just enough to have influence, to have needs, and to have a sense of identity, but to have that emotional connection, to see each other as people connected, to have that shared positive experience together. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna give an example now, um, and then Marisa will follow me with, you know, um, but I'm gonna go from a neighborhood of composite picture of how this begins to play out and between different strategies. Again, this shouldn't be, any one of them should not be unfamiliar to, to you. Um, by working in a neighborhood, it's, we're trying to, you know, strengthen the sense of community can help advance equitable community development to begin to see how we're in it together. So starts with what are the common needs and priorities. So in, in communities, for example, often uh, I've worked in with, with uh, black and white communities where it's experiencing gentrification uh, and change or in either direction where one group is moving in, and it could also be with immigrants, where one group is moving in um, uh, where there have been long-term residents and they see the newcomers as being the source of crime um, or lower property values uh, or family safety. Um, and so beginning to have, focusing on those commonalities and bringing people together to together identify those common needs, those priorities that are for them, the things that are affecting them the most, okay, very critical as a first step. And one community in that we've worked in, it's been, was, was having to do with the safety of bus stops for their children. And that longer term residents who were French Canadians in that case, um, you know, really saw commonality with the concern that members of the Latino community had um, for their for their family members and the safety of their children that enabled them to work together around this common need. Um, membership is often built by, by creating that name, taking that name in neighborhoods that we've worked and you see it, that taking the name of the community, creating a symbol for it, that sense of belonging and membership and creating those positive images. 
being proud of your city. Every city has a slogan, but really trying to make it something that is really integrated, not on park benches only, but really in the way that public discourse about being having a proud community, about making ongoing public commitments and promotion that this is an inclusive community, that being part of this is being part of something that includes others. Um, and that there needs to be safety for all members equally, that that means that in the case of crime, that it's family so that everybody had to be treated not only fairly uh, equally in terms of safety in regards to being able to be protected from uh, crime, violent crime, property crime, but also from police and other services, that they had safety in those situations, that when police responded, they were feeling safe. And through that process of discussion, okay, they were able to see these commonalities and be able to act on them so that they would have the influence on these factors so that they see that we're actually a successful community, that we have that a lot of similar concepts around collective efficacy in the literature and the importance of that um, plays out here as a similar concept where together we see the possibility that we can influence um, our environment, we can control things, we can make things happen in our communities, enable us to be able to have not only feel better, but to make the changes that we own in the way that we see it in our communities. And again, the shared emotional connection through this process of working on a crime issue, on developing that sense of neighborhood and community pride, uh, by organizing and helping people take action together across race, across income groups. Um, in the one neighborhood that I'm thinking about, it was like university professors moving into a historically black community and really each, again, each one seeing the differences um, and blaming each other for, for problems. And through the conversation and through eating, nothing brings people better together than sharing meals, but having facilitated discussions, um, they were able to develop those and talking about their families and children, talking about their lives, not a particular topic, but having the human to human contact um, is critical, one of the many critical things that are important in developing that. Uh, developing that sense, shared emotional connection. And finally, you know, really important that they also have celebrating achievements and successes, like any winning team. Nothing, you know, people feel stronger if their people, members are recognized as well as the collective process is recognized. So that's an example in a residential community. Marisa? Yeah, so the next community example is about an organization. Um, so we believe that strengthening a sense of community can help an organization achieve its DE&I goals and improve an organization overall. Um, so here on the slide, I have a bunch of examples of how any organization can build a sense of community. But what I'm gonna do is walk you through an example of how an organization built a strong sense of community within their organization. Um, so, for meeting needs, how did they meet the common priorities slash needs of their staff and leaders? So this organization um, suffered through the great resignation period and folks were getting really, really burnt out and just feeling like the work was not worth it for them to stay. And the organization couldn't seem to be able to come up with the funds necessary to offer like high enough you know, salaries to be super, super competitive to help with retention. So they turned to other creative ways and they focused a lot on well-being and burnout. And so in addition to, you know, slightly increasing salaries where they could, they introduced a remote model and the very, very attractive uh, four-day work week. And were actually able to address the needs, the common needs of their workforce, which was work-life balance and financial stability. Then for uh, membership, uh, how did this organization develop a sense of membership, belonging, safety, and trust? Um, they already had a few strong uh, employee resource groups, or some organizations call it affinity groups, which was really great, you know, to build positive um, social bonds and a space of emotional safety, especially for historically underrepresented and marginalized employees. But in addition to this, they also began to create 
traditions um, based around their values slash core ideologies. So this organization actually decided to create a tradition of family day or bring like your family to work day kind of thing um, at their organization to try to really reinforce their supportive work culture and also really lean into this prioritization of work-life balance that they were now doing. Um, and also because, you know, you kind of get the bonus of keeping it in the family, quote unquote, right? We love that your mom or that your sister works here and we hope that we can see you here in the future too, right? Um, next is influence. So how did staff slash leaders um, come together to meet these changes or to meet these needs and make these changes? So like I said before, they already had very strong employee resource groups. However, in addition to this, they also introduced official compensated positions for staff members who led the ERGs and officially transformed their decision making process such that the ERG leads were always present um, and always consulted on on all major company decisions. So they also established a um, decision-making framework that was really cool that I don't have time to walk through, but it allowed for complete transparency on those decisions and invited all staff into the decision-making process in a really real way. Um, last was shared emotional connections. So how did they create positive experiences that built common culture or built on common culture, history, needs, or dreams? Um, so this organization built emotional connection by um, one kind of small way was just making a really, really big deal about their organization's anniversary every year, which, yes, great builds great, you know, emotional connection through positive experiences together. But I also wanted to say that they also built emotional connection when they went through COVID-19 together um, because they did this very human centric approach and many staff had these stories of these moments moments of support they experienced from their managers or teams or leadership while they were going through extremely, extremely challenging circumstances. So, um, you know, as important as it is to, for those positive experiences, I think that this was just as important to building that emotional connection in this organization. All right. So that is the example for how an organization has built a strong sense of community. Okay, great. Thank you, Marisa. Yeah. Um, now we want to talk about, you know, the, one of the things I think I heard, and go, we want to talk a little bit more about the strength of community framework and begin to talk about how that can be applied and thought about strategically. Uh, before I do that, I just want to mention that you can see that one of the challenges we found is that uh, everybody has their own way of talking about the same thing, that the social and medical sciences have a whole bunch of different terms. So part of this process is to bring together a lot of the framing of a different term, social capital, a lot of the other literature together, and show that it all works together. And it's not shouldn't be these competing ideas, um, even though there might be some proprietary interests interest in this. It's really talking about the same processes. So we hope to begin to talk about that, to bring what we all, the words that we use together in a more strategic way. So we're going to talk about one as a 5C, something that we often talk about, and then bring that together with also social capital. Um, the five C's really based around, um, you know, what does the literature tell us about what works, about building a strengthening community. So again, everything we're saying um, is really heavily evidence-based. In fact, it's so basic that we don't, even, we, we, we don't even talk about it very much anymore. Um, that, as I mentioned earlier, the importance of building community, that there's nothing more important in the literature, medical literature, that shows the importance of that connectedness, that bonding, a lot of stuff on alienation, social support, social world. But in different ways we slice it, this is really important. Connections, those relationships, as we talk about in social capital, relationships being very critical um, to, the, to people's well-being as well as change. That sense of individual and collective control, okay, also among the top things that, um, that show that the foster social and uh, physical uh, well-being. Um, do you have that individual sense of control of your life? Do you collectively have that um, as a group, that collective efficacy that comes with that that's really critical? Um, and next to finally 
is the idea of cash. Do you have enough cash? Cannot uh, take away the the economic importance, the importance of economics. I'm sorry, um, and then having a, having a sense that you have enough cash to survive and be able to live and have your life. And then finally, all this is good, but um, change doesn't happen unless there's collective action. So the five C's are the fundamental part of our of our uh, strength and community framework, which talks about the importance of developing community, connections among people and institutions, that sense of individual and collective control, making sure that there are the resources, the cash available for people to have the lives that they aspire to, and to take collective action to make sure that all this has happened and the larger systems are held accountable to keep this going. Um, we also, wanted to refresh your on social capital, which got a lot of play for a while. Um, and then how those concepts, those relationships, these are diff three different types of relationships that are really important to focus on. The first being bonding, those close relationships within people within a group or that sense of community. Uh, the relation bridging, the second, um, where relationships between groups of people who have different characteristics, but that you find commonality and bridge together across different communities. And thirdly, linking those relationships between these communities and larger systems and institutions. So the, so the five C's and the social capital form the basis of what we call the strength and community framework. Thanks, David. And this is how it all comes together. If you look at this diagram and you look at the blue box that says group one, um, this is the idea that within group one, the sense of community needs to be strengthened so that they their needs are being met, they feel like they belong, they have influence over their community, and there's a shared emotional connection. And with this sense of community, then they're able to take collective action. They're able to connect. They're able to care for one another. They're able to exert control over matters that affect their members' well-being and then ensure that there's adequate economic opportunity, financial assets, and other resources for their members to be able to thrive. And if they did all that, the hope is that then they'll have physical, social, psychological well-being and a very supportive social environment. Now, imagine that that happens in all the different groups that we have, and they form this community. So remember, there's also community within communities. But let's take another group. That's group two in the yellow box. You're repeating the same process. This group is also strengthening their own sense of community because they see themselves as part of belonging to this one group. Now, if these two groups came together to then get to know each other and to develop a sense of community and undergo the same process towards the five C's and then challenge the larger systems around them, um, then you've got that bridging going on and the linking going on. So again, if two communities now with their very strong sense of community can come together and then see how each of their groups now have something in common, right? So they're able to look at how their needs are being met now by coming together. They're being able to see how they can belong to something bigger than just it, one community, but now two communes because they see something similar and they share some commonalities. And they're able to exert influence that's larger, that goes beyond their community, but whatever influence they're able to exert now actually benefits two communities or two groups of people. Um, and then together, what they're doing is they're able to then link to larger systems that actually serve both groups of people. Um, so making sure that these systems through, I think David mentioned earlier, through organizing, through affecting policies, everything else, making sure that these larger systems, such as the education system, the healthcare system, um, the transportation infrastructure now actually is, are responsive to more than just one group's needs, but now multiple groups. So if you can imagine of this being exponential and you can have many, many groups now and a lot of bridging going on and then them being able to see their commonalities, they have unique differences and unique traditions, but they can also see where they're common, can come together and then exert influence on those systems that are supposed to be responsive to them and support their needs and be there for them. And what, what does this mean by equity and justice? Well, if these groups begin to take on issues that affect one group that's experiencing disparities and seeing that that is not just that group's problem, 
but it's all our problem to make sure that we all can get to a better place, then you're really moving towards equity and justice. Um, here's an example, an experience that we had. Um, a, two, two very distinct communities in a place. Um, one that is that identifies with its Vietnamese identity and another with Black identity create it, bridges, right? And to be able to then link to the state system to collectively advocate for access to state resources post-disaster for Vietnamese speaking families. So they saw that the state had all these resources post-disaster, but that access to those resources were not getting to the Vietnamese speaking families because there was insufficient interpretation assistance and translated materials. So now it's not just the Vietnamese community saying, hey, we need this you know, translated and we need these interpretation to be able to support our families. You've now got the black community coming in and say, hey, our neighbors need the support and together we will all be better for it. And sort of that's a big, that's a quick pro quo, right? To be completely honest. And then with that, the Vietnamese community who has always dominated the shrimping industry in this place is now saying, okay, how do we make sure that the black families also have access to jobs in the shrimping industry? Right, so the resources that are coming down from the states post disaster is not just benefiting the Vietnamese speaking families, but now there's an opportunity to say, what does that look like if we expand this shipping industry and now other communities have access to that industry? And then they're both advocating together as well to say to the state, your management of your post disaster resources should not be managed by an out of state organization. Mm -hmm. I think that was a, an example of. Uh, the state in the South that got a, an agency in New England to manage their post-disaster resources, as opposed to actually having an organization within state who understands the communities, who probably can have better connections with the communities to be able to manage the resources and make sure they're accessible because they understand the context and everything else. And in doing this, we're making progress towards equity and justice because we're looking at something that's accessible to everybody and changing practices that will benefit more than just one community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And just because now I'm gonna give you a spontaneous question, Ken, because we have a minute saved. Um, <laughs> and this is going back to, and I think it's probably on people's minds right now is that what we were just talking about right before about red and blue um, communities and that whole idea of how the notion that both with media and politicians creating this image of the red team and the blue team, it creates a sense of community then how do we then bridge that around those commonalities? So I'm going to throw the sol solution to our national polarization to you in one minute. But I, I think the point is that example there that we've talked about in the group that you were just in might be very useful to help people understand how how this is being played and how the division is being played out and that a new dialogue and new efforts, both in policies and strategies, can work. You're asking a question about how this, how, how, how what, yeah, what about, how, about, about the common element you're experiencing with red, yeah. the session of red. It, it, first of all, I can't, I can't say enough about the importance of having leadership in these communities who understand the importance of bridging, yeah. um, so that they're not contributing to the polarization and they're really trying to bridge. Um, and then having someone who can facilitate that conversation and that process. Um, and in this situation, that's exactly what happened. You had leadership who was really committed to it, and you had somebody who was able to facilitate that process. Um, I think the lead, we also have to remember, and I think this this um, example did, did kind of demonstrate this, the leadership also has to make sure that the community is on board. How do you bring your community along in this process? Because because this kind of bridging is not happening between individuals, it's happening between leadership and groups of people. Um, so it's looking at it at a, at, a, at, a, at a community level and not always at an individual level. So there's a question of to the leaders about, yeah, how is your community bought into this kind of bridging? What do you need inside your community? And sometimes you need to strengthen the sense of community inside your community, but then you also have to strengthen their capacity to bridge um, and to see that there is a commonality. And there are very clear strategies, tactics we've seen work. I mean, organizing is one of them. We've seen it. When, if you use organizing as a strategy, you're getting people to identify what their concerns are. And then you see the commonalities, right? Which was what happened here, right? Basically the, con the common concern was that those post-disaster resources were not getting to our communities. 
right? Right. and not benefiting all our communities. Good. I think it's critical. So I want to talk about this is all sounds really good and smooth. And I think also, but there are challenges with it. And I think one of the things we see is that I'm not going to go through this list. All this information will be sent out to everybody so you can have the full uh, materials to read. But I think it's important to understand what Ken just, just was saying is that clearly one of the side benefits of strengthening communities is that we create boundaries of who is in and who is out and that these boundaries could be uh, rigid and exclusionary. And so it's really important that working with leaders um, who and finding leadership in the community that really do promote inclusive values, starting somewhere with them and beginning to bridge them with other leaders. Now, what we've seen among cities, small towns, among leaders who want, who come from conservative states, um, red states who understand the nece necessity of inclusion because of problems have been able, they have be able to work with other mayors and other leaders to show the benefits of being inclusive. We operate out of our self-interest, okay? That's okay. We have to work, what is that self-interest? That common self-interest that we find, okay, is what we sometimes call enlightened self-interest. When you realize by working with others, that enables us to accomplish what we need. And that through change, through that positive relationship, we change our attitudes towards each other. It's not the other way around. So that it's really critical that we begin to see that in short, that while there's a challenge in developing a sense of community that may create who's in and who's out, that we begin to show examples and promote examples and messaging about being inclusive, the importance and, and, and benefits of it, and to show how opportunities have actually worked where people have come together rather than emphasizing how people have been divided. Simple as it is, but critical. And, and, and do more discussion that we don't have now. Um, but uh, the questions are already um, uh, jumping out about measurement and evaluation. And so we're quickly going over this. this is not a panacea. We just kind of overviewing things for further discussion. Um, but we know that people are interested in, so what do you do to evaluate these things as well? Um, so there we go. Um, what are the questions that we should first be asking, starting with the evaluation questions? Um, and that is, what are the, you know, what is being done, very simply, to uh, address common needs that people experience common needs, not that's been top down, that they build their influence both collectively and individually, to develop a sense of membership and a shared emotional connection. That's the bonding, that's your sense of community. You can do the same thing with policy analysis, as I mentioned earlier, looking at do policies deal with, with felt need by people? Do they build people's influence, okay, over their environment, over their lives? Does it develop a sense of membership and belonging with them and in others? Uh, and finally, does it create those shared emotional connections? Is it just a technical solution or there's, is there the people component? to it. Also, um, how are asking about how are key organizations successfully collaborating within and across communities? Successfully is the key word here, successfully. Not just are they happy and satisfied with collaboration exchanging, but are they achieving things? So that's what there's a lot of measures on how to collaborate. So it was measured in collaborate bridge. That's not the problem. Looking at success and goal attainment of of these collaborations is what's missing in a lot of the literature and what's really important and important to publicize. How have systems changed through community strengthening? What are those systems, what are the connections? Do people know more about city government, how it operates in larger systems? Are the systems more responsive to community needs? Okay. And finally, you know, how are relationships changing? And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Ken. They'll talk about the intergroup relations continuum. Thank you, David. Um, this was something that we actually developed based on a lot of research, um, but also experienced with projects that were actually doing a lot of um, bridging. And what we found, uh, there's sort of five stages. Um, and it's not as if those stages are that clear, right? It's not as if you cross this line and you're in the next stage. They are blurry. Um, you know, sometimes you can move into two stages ahead and then an event happens and you're back to two stages, you know, behind before. So it's it's not like it's linear. It's not as if it's always this clean. It's not without its challenges. Um, but I want to point out what we've learned in the kind of this, the, the stages that we've seen groups of 
people go through when they're trying to do the bridging and the linking. Um, you're really starting from where you, you're stereotyping each other. Right? You probably can't stand each other. Um, you're competitive. There's conflict. Um, you don't, you, you disrespect each other's, um, you know, traditions. Um, and then you move to a point to realize that you kind of have to coexist even you don't, if you don't necessarily like each other or there's a conflict. And so when you move into that coexisting space, it's more sort of, okay, let's just know who the other group is, is in this space. Um, let's just respect that there are some boundaries and turf still, but like we can you know, coexist in the same space without having conflict that's harmful. Um, if you're able to keep staying in that space and then continue to bridge a little bit more, because there might be leadership who's willing to bridge more, um, then you move into cooperation, where you sort of now start to assist each other when one calls on the other for some help. So now, you know, I can give you some help when you ask for it. I can support you when you need something. We can exchange information. Um, moving then into collaboration, where you suddenly realize that you, you have some common goals, you, you share some similarities, and we can all work on those things that we share in common and make things better for everybody. And so now groups might start participating, members from different groups might start participating in the decision making process. You still have one group taking the lead um, and having the primary responsibility. Moving into integration, which is probably the hardest hardest part of the process to move into as you begin to say, now, how do we actually combine our resources together? How do we have shared equal power in decision-making? Where is that you know, equity? Where is that equality? And where is that shared responsibility? And you know, this, this stage, as we've seen some groups go, get into, it's, it's tough to do. It's tough to do because it takes a lot of support and an infrastructure that can really sustain this. Um, and as we're doing this, as you can see sort of this um, funnel that kind of opens up, is that the idea that there's really growing trust, growing cross-cultural understanding, um, growing, you know, growing power sharing. And this can happen at three levels. I mean, people in a group at the individual level may be doing this. Um, and that that's good to some level, but you need then like organizations that are part of those communities to also do this because they're sort of the ones that bridge the, the members of their community with the members of another community. And then there's institutional and community level. And so now you've got the institutions, the systems that are all also doing this. And again, as I mentioned before, it's a dynamic process. Um, it's not static. It can change for the better or for the worse, depending on what's happening in the surrounding. Thank you. I'll turn it back to you, David. Great, thank you. Okay, and so, um, oops, got more. Um, designing your evaluation has certain um, key things that any evaluator would um, uh, want to take off. First of all, it's what are you trying to achieve and what are those evaluation questions? Um, this is not just like one thing and we'll talk more about trying to achieve you know, sense of community, but it can be reducing crime, economic development, improving education. Uh, it could be improving work-life work, work -life balance or the quality of work life. So it's really still focusing on the goal because it's still meeting the common needs and it ultimately comes back, are you achieving what people felt need is, most important felt needs are. The time period is always, always important. Um, you know, for the initiative in that, we're not, there's none, you know, these are basic evaluation considerations. The most important elements to measure is to what extent our activities implemented as planned to build a sense of community. It's usually stuff that, that we found the foundation of government. It's, it's the title, but there's nothing underneath that really supports it. Okay. So it's an easy to call everything community and then just do the same old stuff. So the question is to what extent are those activities actually implemented um, that have to do with it, as well as being able to, and to the extent they are, able to build a sense of community, bridge communities, organize. And that's where the priority is. So it's making a priority in the evaluation. Again, things can be, the number and quality of collective actions new and strengthen the outputs of that. Um, the improved capacity, we've, we've done a capacity assessment. We moved, I think we mentioned before, but in an earlier webinar, but we have done a capacity assessment of grantees. Do they have capacity for organizing and community building within their organization? Um, so assessing capacity is really critical. Other changes in relationships among people, organizations, and communities. We'll talk a little bit about that. 
as well in a moment. Um, what are changes in systems? Are there the outcomes? Again, people are not fooled very long about this. There has to be changes in the quality of life and the systems in order for these things to happen. This is not, we're not talking about a kumbaya experience here where everyone's just going to feel good. It's based on the fact that your community, any team is successful. If you remember the Titans, it's the team winning. Okay, in the movie, it's not just the fact that everybody had a, a, a you know meal together and a good time on the bus. Um, and so it's really important to understand that those changes and that sense of security that comes from that are really important uh, as well. So those are the major things. And considering that, it has to do with results as well as taking, making sure that these community building processes are given uh, all the support that are needed and therefore the evaluation of them. We'll talk now about the specific types of measures and approaches to that further. So. All right. Um, so for those of you who, of course, attended the last webinar, this will definitely be a review, but we do have a way to measure sense of community among individuals, which is the sense of community index. Um, so the SCI is the most frequently used measure of sense of community. It was developed by community science, and it's a survey index that when you take it, it provides an overall sense of community score, as well as subscale scores for membership, influence, fulfillment of needs, and shared emotional connection. It's important to note that there are two versions of the sense of community, and we really, really recommend that you use the um, SEI2 because in this version, we improve the reliability, the validity, and the clarity of uh, this index. All right, so where can you find the SCI 1 and 2? So we do have a website. It is the senseofcommunity.com. And on that website, you can actually um, access and ask for permission to use both of the indices. And they are available in multiple languages, which is very helpful. Um, and also on the site, we have a document library as well um, that has a lot of publications that are surrounding the indices. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here is that we do, coming soon, we we do have um, the SCI2 Global Benchmarking Study publication that hopefully will be coming around soon. And so now that the index has been out and used long enough, we uh, now can start benchmarking scores, which means offering the ability to uh, name what is typical um, for a type of community so that you can better understand, for example, let's say um, how your residential community's sense of community compares to other residential communities, okay? And finally, we have, um, well, you know, while we do have the SCI um, and it is the most widely used, there are other ways to measure a sense of community. For example, there are other um, similar self-assessments like the brief sense of community scale, the three factors psychological sense of community scale, and also ones that are uh, not just indices, right? Unobtrusive and other measures like focus groups where you can, and interviews where you can directly ask community, community members, um, you know, to identify and define community indicators. There's also numerous ways you could do observational methods, whether it's, you know, documenting street level symbols of belonging or photographing social events, common spaces, et cetera, or just observing behaviors in, in a particular community, right? So those are all the examples of other ways to measure change in a sense of community and among individuals at least. And I will go ahead and turn it to Kian. Thanks, Marisa. Um, something that often comes up also is then how do you measure change in relationships among organizations and communities? And a very, very common um, method is the social network analysis um, that results in a sociogram. And you know, the social network analysis can really look at different units. It can look at the individual, so you can be tracking relationships between individuals, or you can even track relationships between organizations, so your unit is the organization. Um, it helps to understand, um, to get information about the purpose of the relationship. So if you're trying to do an SNA, you want to understand the purpose of that relationship. Um, you want to understand and make sure you have the, the contact person Right, or the organization that the person represents. So, you know, who are you asking that question um, to? You have to identify that. 
You want to know about frequency of contact, um, and sometimes it's the quality of the contact as well. Um, and then the outcome of the contact, what, what has this contact done for you or for the group um, or for your organization? Um, I think SNA is normal is, is used and we, in our experience, what happens is that you, you get into some really wonderful, beautiful diagrams, but not always helpful to everybody if you don't think on the front end of what you really need. Um, and so I think here are, some, here are three things that we feel that if you don't know on the front end, doing a, a, a social network analysis resulting in a sociogram may not necessarily be useful. One is you really want to understand the representativeness of the person. You know, is the person speaking for themselves? Is the person speaking for an organization? Is the person speaking for the community, right? So is it just a, another member? Is it an organizational executive director? Is it an elected official? Um, and then you're looking at making sure you have, under, uh, have clear expectations from the start about the desired changes in the relationships. Um, what, did, what did you expect? What did you want to change? So, you know, you end up in a sociogram, which I'll show in a few minutes of these wonderful lines and hubs and spokes and everything else that we call it. But so what? Was that, were you expecting to see more hubs? Were you expecting to see more lines? Um, that often, we don't often think about that on the front end um, and get more enamored on the with the diagrams. Because this, what this really means then, if you know what's the change you wanna see in that sociogram, you got to make sure that your strategies are strong enough, right? Or your interventions are all strong enough to drive towards that diagram you really want to see at the end, which may be like more, more hubs, more lines, uh, more dense lines, whatever it is, right? You can even measure re reciprocity in a social network analysis. So if you want more reciprocity between two people, two organizations, you want to make sure that your interventions are actually moving people, people towards that or else you end up with a diagram that is great, but you're not sure how to interpret it. Um, and so here's an example of you know, what you wanna look at. And in this example, we actually measured authenticity and authentic relationships. And we had a whole definition for it that I will, won't go into here. But you know, the idea is that, right, you, you have a time one and time two. And you can say that in time one, here's the baseline, but what we really wanna drive into time two is more authentic relationships. We want to see relationships move from less authentic to really completely authentic. And if you have a strategy that did that, right, to be able to create environments that did that and all of that, then what you're able to see is the actual change here from a few green lines to a lot of green lines. And then you can interpret this, right? And you can say, we're making a difference. But if you don't have that clarified on the front end, and I cannot emphasize this enough, you will have one diagram, and then you have another diagram, and you'll find yourself asking, well, was this what we wanted? Um, is this where we want to be? Is this, does this diagram means we have achieved what we want to achieve? And that, that's when then it becomes, the diagram just becomes a great diagram and nothing else. And with that, I think we, I will move to this part. So, um, in measuring changes in relationships, you see the changes in the in the socio diagram, but then what's the outcome? What's the systemic change? And so here's what we have some examples of it. Emergency response time by the system. And this is really indicative of whether or not you're able to close disparities in response time by your you know, um, first respondents between a low-income community and a neighboring very wealthy community, right? So is, is the fire department going to respond to um, the low-income community in five minutes, just like it would to its neighboring wealthy community. Change in perception of responsiveness of larger systems. This is really indicative of whether um, people in the community is actually improving their trust in the system because of the linking that you're doing as a result of being able to bridge several communities together. You know, are they feeling that they can actually trust that system to be able to support them? And another one is the greater knowledge of systems and indi individuals in, in those systems. This really talks to the system's um, accessibility, right? Is it so accessible that people understand what that system is supposed to do? They know how to navigate the system. So these are some of the examples of the systemic outcomes that you can see if you're able to get from the bonding, the bridging to the linking. Great, thank you. Sure. Yeah. That is, so before we get to try to take a question or two here, I just wanted to mention that the, these resources will be available 
to everybody uh, that's attended. Um, if you have further questions, you can send them on to, to us through the webinar. I think it's at, or you can send to info at communityscience.com. If you want further information, we'll do our best. Obviously, this was just one hour to cover a huge subject that's really important that could be, you know, uh, it's something that deserves a lot more of weeks and years of attention. But we think it's a starting point to be able to bring attention to this issue and a framing that's really important and evidence based, research based importance that no one can own. It's not a package deal. It's really a framing that we have to apply to our strategies as foundations, government agencies, and public and private policy within organizations as well if we're going to foster well being and the connectedness and address the critical issues that we're facing at this time. So with that, you know, I'm going to emphasize that this is just not another thing that we clearly see this above all as a framing but important to this and we get out of the weeds to see the big picture about the human experience and the challenges we're facing uh, globally right now, as well as nationally and locally. So with that, um, is I don't know if there are any questions. There's none in the... There's none in the um... In, in the chat, David, but maybe yes. since we have a couple of minutes, okay. I brought up the questions that were submitted during registration. Ah. Yes. And okay. here's one very clear question. Um, are there any tactical successful examples of health systems or healthcare organizations engaging with underrepresented community groups to build trust and decrease health inequities? It's a big question. <laughs> it's a lot. The person is saying that there's lots of webinars with great ideas, but like, let's have an actual case study. <laughs> cool. Any thoughts? <laughs> a, in in the um, health areas, I I can I can you know it's, this is a spontaneous right a recollection. I think one of the things that was very important, and I'll I'll, I'll do this quickly is that Maimonides Hospital in the Bronx in New York had an interesting program for its, I think it's a quick example for its residents, medical residents, which was for them to go out. This was like the medical, this is physicians, not your community health workers. And I think it's an important thing because every system has their people who work with the community, but necessarily people who, that's not necessarily people who are delivering on behalf or for the community. And there's a difference. And so they had, and actually they did it with nurse, nurse practitioners and others in that they began to have them go door to door to identify what those needs were, okay? And that had a radical change in the way that they began policy and decision-making. They, they created a, a community among doctors and residents, not patients, okay? Not just patients, I should say. I think that's one example that quickly comes to mind. I know in the health area, they've done a lot to be able to reach out. You know, we're working in Baltimore or with health systems that are also trying to use for funding. But I think it's really about something that now is about relationships. I don't know if anybody else has anything. And probably there are certainly not an area I work a lot in, but. Yeah, I, I can add a little bit to it. And I think it might help answer some of the questions that's in the chat right now too. Ah. Um, oh, Henry, okay. Yeah, um, I, I think part of it is is in terms of just knowing who to go to, who do you speak to first? It's uncovering, most importantly, who are the influential people in the community and, 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 and who do people listen to, whether it's an organization or the community. There is an informal layer of people that are influencers. And, and there's, there's no way to uncover these folks. I think of the work that we did, David, early on in Washington, D.C., where you know, when you're trying to figure out who's the leader of this one particular, you know, the Salvadoran community or the Vietnamese community and all, like, who do they go to? And that's not, that's, there's no yellow pages. Yeah. We no longer have yellow pages, right? Like even in internet searches, there's no clear way of saying, here's the person. You can go to a nonprofit that serves that community, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the leader of that nonprofit is the person that communities trust. Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes yeah. nonprofits are there because they're able to raise the money and become big and establish and do everything, but that doesn't mean that they have roots in those communities. And so it's really asking a lot of questions of people who are in that community. And we went to, you know, you're going to a grocery shop, you're looking at what's on the, on the, on the board in the grocery shop. You're going to a restaurant, 
you're looking, you're going to places to pick up ethnic newspapers in, in this particular example we did. And then you're asking people like, who do you go to? Um, I remember walking into different faith institutions and speaking to the faith leader there from a Hindu temple to a church and saying, who do, who do, who do your people listen to? You know, who do they go to? And by doing that, you're unco uncovering a layer of leaders that are very much rooted in their community. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have to figure out how to bridge them with the formal leadership, right? And that's part of the work. Um, but that takes time. Right. Um, you know, with, with one, I remember a, a health agency in the city that wanted to reach out to communities and the idea of community engagement and, not, and two words that get used a lot without a lot of depth what they did was they went out and they said, we're going out and doing town hall meetings and telling them what we're doing. That's not community engagement. Right. Um, <laughs> let me Sorry. just jump in quickly for time's sake. Um, it's one thing is that, I'm going to answer globally the questions there that Henry and others have, which is that, and summary of what Ken said, to say that it's not your job to have all the answers. It's your job to be able to find work with the, the organizations that are already there. Every community within it has its own organization, whether it be a formal organization or an informal social organization. And it's your genuine, authentic partnership with those groups. They're the ones who help identify the leaders. They're the ones who will help you be able to make those relationships. Don't reinvent um, don't reinvent the wheels. Um, in terms of case studies example, I think that we're glad to share that. I think everybody, there should be a forum for sharing these examples. I would say the work that we've done and uh, the Harwood Institute has done as an example of places that do have case studies uh, and do have that. I think this is, a lot of this is going on in America. The media is not covering it. It's not bad news. One of the blessings in my work life has been the fact to see that this is happening all over the place. We're just not hearing about it and i think elevating these stories is one of the is one of the first things we can all do together so i want to thank marisa and kian and of course always dante for doing this work and for all of you for taking the time to share with us and to continue this conversation going so with that i wish everybody a good rest of your day whatever time of day that might be thank you so thank much you. thank you